Welcome to the Women of Color Attorneys on Success and Authentic Selves webinar. We welcome you to our webinar, and as you can see on the interface, you have some things below the slides that will help you through this webinar. If you have some questions, you have a yellow little icon that you can click on and enter questions as needed as you need help with some basic things that may be happening through the webinar. The Q&A symbol is one that you can ask for questions that you might want to ask the audience or for the panelists to answer for our question and answer period at the end of the webinar. For resources, there's a green icon at the bottom of the screen, and those resources in there are the slide deck as well as links to our toolkits. The blue icon is with our panelist bios, where you can read them at depth, as today we'll be doing a short presentation of their bios, but not to the extent of their full bios. And then also the slide deck, which you can download after the webinar, as you would like. The, the question and answer period will be near the end of the webinar. We encourage you to ask questions, and they will be answered accordingly. And if anything else comes up, please feel free to put them in the question and answer box. We will, we will address them as they come up. I'm very excited to announce our opening remarks by Michelle Coleman Mays, the Vice President, General Counsel, and Secretary of the New York Public Library. Good afternoon or good morning, depending on wherever you may be located. And welcome to the Women of Color Attorneys on Success and Authentic Selves. The Commission has been endeavoring since its existence, which is 28 years ago, to ensure that women have equal opportunities for professional growth and advancement similar to that of their male counterparts. And as most of you well know, based on the statistics, that journey still continues. So why the Women of Color Research Initiative? The studies that the Commission undertook some time ago show unequivocally that the express career trajectories and experiences of women of color are simply different. And while those experiences are different, they should not and cannot obliterate what we share in common, which is the desire to be exceptional professionals. Many years ago, I was asked a question as to whether I considered myself to be black, first or a female first? And I pondered that question and was somewhat puzzled by it, and I said, well, context does matter. But at the end of the day, to do what I need to do, I have to bring all of me to the table. So today we're going to talk about these differences and devote time to understanding and gaining insights about women of color because we think it will assist all of us become better, to become better professionals. The Women of Color Toolkit is turnkey, and I mean that just like it sounds. You can simply download it, and you will find it has research reports, program agenda, PowerPoint slides, handouts, library scenario, a library of scenarios, discussion guide, speakers bureau, bibliography. And importantly, it is truly free. There is no catch. And we hope that for those of you listening to this webinar, that it will encourage you to download this free of charge toolkit. And at the end of the day, armed with this insight, this critical insight, we can all move forward successfully, locked arm in arm as our authentic selves. So let's get on with the webinar. And to do that, I'd like to introduce our moderator, our fearless leader who has been whipping us into shape, Jasmine French. Jasmine is an employee benefits attorney at Ice Miller LLP in Indianapolis, Indiana. Jasmine. Thank you so much, Michelle. I am excited about today's webinar and believe that each of you on today's call are in for a real, real treat. We have some amazing panelists who will be sharing their personal experiences with us in order to impart some, some real wisdom. Our first panelist is Patty ferguson Bonney. Professor ferguson Bonney is currently the faculty director 
of the Indian Legal Program at the Sandra Day O'Connor College of Law at Arizona State University. She is also the director of the Indian Legal Clinic and law professor. Professor Ferguson Bonney has represented tribal clients in administrative, state, federal, and tribal courts and is a trusted voice on tribal issues, most notably voting rights. Patty clerked for Judge Betty Benz Fletcher of the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, and she has received several awards, including being named an American Bar Foundation Fellow. Patty is a member of the Point d'Achien Indian Tribe and is joining today's call from Tempe, Arizona. Welcome, Patty. Our next panelist is Wendy Sheba. Wendy is a retired corporate attorney and business executive with a stellar career in private practice, government service, and education. During her career, Wendy has served as an executive officer of three New York Stock Exchange listed companies. From 2007 to 2010, Wendy was executive vice president, uh, general counsel, and secretary of KB Home, one of the nation's largest home builders. Wendy is extremely active at the leadership level of many professional organizations. She is um, one of the commissioners of the Commission on Women of the Profession, and she is a past president of the National Asian Pacific American Bar Association, uh, known as NAPABA. Wendy has held several board and leadership positions with numerous nonprofit organizations, and her accomplishments and commitment to diversity in the profession have been recognized at the highest level, including being awarded the ABA Spirit of Excellence Award and the Corporate Council Women of Colors Diamond Award, both in 2014. On a personal note, I will also add that Wendy was um, single-handedly responsible for encouraging me, and, and I hope after today many of you will look into the Collaborative Bar Leadership Academy, CBLA, which is a great program for um, young bar leaders across all of the national diverse bar associations as well as the ABA. Wendy is joining today's call from Los Angeles, California, and we are happy to have her with us for such an important discussion. At last, but certainly not least, we have uh, Melvin Williams, Jr. Melvin is joining today's call from Chicago, where, um, but he is uh, currently general counsel at the U.S. Small Business Administration a role he was appointed to in November 2014. In this role, Melvin is responsible for tackling the often complex legal issues associated with the SBA's efforts to grow the business sector and create jobs. Prior to his appointment, Melvin served as the General Counsel and Corporate Secretary of the Millennium Challenge Corporation, which is a U.S. foreign development agency created in 2014 to address global issues such as poverty reduction, food security, corruption, and the effectiveness of foreign aid. Melvin has uh, private sector roots stemming from his 13 years at Citigroup as a director in the general counsel's office. And like Wendy, Melvin is also a commissioner of the Commission on Women in the Profession. And in putting together today's panel, we thought it was critical to include a male perspective. Um, and we are delighted that Melvin has agreed to participate, as he definitely is someone who gets it when it comes to advocating for women lawyers. So as you can see by their impressive bios, today's speakers have been there and accomplished that. And the fact that they are willing to impart some of their wisdom today is really very uh, special. After our time together during today's webinar, we believe that the following objectives will have been met. Uh, said more simply, today's really about learning, listening, and linking. Learning because you will walk away with a clear sense of why the Commission exists and its areas of focus. You've already heard from Michelle, and you will learn even more about the framework of the Women of Color Research Initiative. And finally, you'll walk away with knowledge that there are some really fantastic toolkits that have been developed to um, equip you, your colleagues, your partners, your supervisors, with the tools to discuss issues confronting women of color attorneys, and more importantly, to identify solutions to the challenges we face. Here's a snapshot of today's format. Ten minutes uh, or so will be used to describe the research findings. Uh, a discussion of a scenario that we've selected in order to give everyone a real sense of how you might approach moving through each of the scenarios that Michelle mentioned are currently available free of charge as part of the toolkit. We will get the great benefit of hearing from each of the panelists um, 
as they share what they have done or would have done, perhaps, um, in certain scenarios as a part of kind of a lightning round. And then finally, uh, we will open up the um, portion of the webinar for um, audience questions. So with that, Wendy? Thank you very much, Jasmine. Um, as Jas Jasmine mentioned to you, I serve as a commissioner on the Commission on Women in Profession, and under Michelle Coleman May's leadership, I am the co-chair of our Women of Color uh, Research Initiative. So what I wanted to do was to take you through a very high-level summary of the research reports that, that have under um, lied the actual creation of the toolkit that we'll be discussing today. So on the first slide, we have a summary of three really groundbreaking research reports that have been published by the Commission on Women. You can see leading off in 2006, we had Visible Invisibility, Women of Color in Law Firms. We followed that up with um, uh, a study of Actually, the third one came chronologically from visible invisibility to visibly successful. And um, taking off on the findings of the 2006 study, the 2008 study spelled out specific strategies that could be employed by law firms and the women of color who work in those law firms. And then in 2012, the commission published visible invisibility, women of color in Fortune 500 legal departments. These three studies and um, executive summaries that make the information fairly digestible uh, are all available for download on the ABA Commission on Women website, and I would encourage you to take an in-depth look at those studies. Um, this is the download URL, and it will be available when you um, access the slide deck after, after today's presentation. Now, what I wanted to do is to go through some of the key findings of these three research reports. Um, we've grouped these into major categories, and it's very obviously very high level. We didn't want to overwhelm you with um, a lot of dense graphs, statistics, um, and the like. But I wanted to give you some of the high level findings. So first, uh, in the area of compensation, you can see in the major bullet points that um, women we know, we have long known that women are lagging behind men generally in compensation. And if you look at the specific cohorts, um, the, the, the picture for women of color is bleaker than it is for both men of color and for their sisters, white women. Um, so we have quite a, a bit of ground to make up in the area of compensation. In the next slide, thank you. Um, we did a lot of work in the studies to find out what is happening in recruitment um, and hiring for women of color. Now, here's the good news. The good news is that, by and large, women of color reported no bias that was apparent to them at the hiring stage. However, women of color believed that they are the least likely to be hired for senior or executive level. So they feel that although they can get in the door, um, they may be relegated to the more junior positions within their respective institutions. And in the next slide, um, we talk about the all-important retention. It's one thing to recruit and get people in the door, but you know the, the, where the rubber really hits the road is in the area of retention and promotion, um, not only of all attorneys of color, but in particular women of color. So the, the studies were very informative in telling us that women of color feel the least likely to have a mentor at the senior or executive level in their organization. They feel they have limited access to key networks in order to thrive and advance within their organizations. Um, they are the most likely, compared to other uh, cohorts of attorneys, to report demeaning or harassing comments. And they are also the most likely to report missing out on highly desirable assignments. So these are key findings about how women of color are doing once they're actually on the job. And in the area of advancement, um, as I said, women of color feel that they're the least likely to be thought of for advancement to senior and executive level positions. And why is this? Well, they report that um, the path to advancement is not readily transparent to them. Um, they also believe that stereotypes and double standards follow them throughout their careers, especially as they achieve positions of authority. 
Um, and of course, there's the concern we, we talked about in the earlier slide about compensation. Women of color believe that they earn less from day one than their other groups. So these are the major findings, and, and what does it all mean for us? Well, on the one hand, um, it's significant in that it validates all of our feelings. It's always good to know, you know that each of us is not alone when we have these particular experiences and um, reactions to them. So it validates us. But beyond that, I want to stress that it's not just a pity party. And I think that the, the importance of our toolkit that arose from the studies is that it's one thing when we sit around in a circle and we share our experiences. As I said, it's validating, it's reinforcing, but we want to move beyond that to solutions and action plans. And the findings of the three seminal studies that we did on women of color in both law firms and in um, Fortune 500 legal departments have informed our work in developing the Women of Color Program Toolkit. You've already heard from Jasmine and Michelle about the toolkit and how we're going to actually demonstrate it to you, to you today. Um, I think the really significant thing about the toolkit is that each of the scenarios, and we, we are up to 10 scenarios in our library so far with more in the work, were specifically informed by the research findings. There is data um, behind each of the scenarios. So, you know, we didn't, we didn't just dream up these hypotheticals. We specifically wrote them based on the research um, to try to give voice to the concerns of women of color and more importantly, to bring that discussion to the table so that it can be employed in, um, in various settings. So we're providing these real world examples of what women of color face in the workplace. We're specifically trying to give strategies that will empower them and ensure their upward mobility and success. And we're also seeking to bring this conversation to the broader audience, whether it be firm management committees, general counsel, bar association leadership, um, the various fora in which we um, in which we participate. So we will encourage you to look at the toolkits. They are available at no cost on our website, and to think about ways in which you can use the toolkit. It's a meeting in a box um, for something as casual and informal as a brown bag lunch for a group of uh, you and your colleagues to a very formal program that you might put on for your law firm, your corporate legal department, or your bar association. And um, Jasmine, that is a very high-level summary of the toolkit, and I think now we're going to move into the actual demonstration. Great. Thank you, Wendy. So for those who haven't had a chance to visit the um, website, we have put together a variety of scenarios that, as Wendy mentioned, reflect a lot of thought um, and often stem from um, direct or indirect exposure to the scenarios that uh, that we've summarized. And as part of the toolkit, individuals will be given a facilitator guide that uh, will allow you to um, think of creative ways and prompt you to ask certain questions when using the toolkit within your organization as a discussion point. So for the benefit of the group, We've selected a scenario that um, that is a part of the um, existing um, toolkit, and uh, we will go through it um, just at a high level, but really to give everyone a sense of of how best to to move through these these really powerful um, scenarios. So we are going to be looking at scenario ten, feeling pigeonholed, marginalized, and frustrated with career. So this involves involves um, Elizabeth, and um, feel free to just kind of follow along. Again, high-level factual scenario. Elizabeth is a third-year associate at a medium-sized law firm in D.C. Uh, she's originally from Wisconsin, and she's an enrolled member of the Ojibwe tribe. Um, Elizabeth is excited about the work uh, she's been able to do at the firm on issues in Native American law. Um, in fact, she didn't think she'd have much of an opportunity in this area, but she's concerned that it has accounted for the majority of her work assignments. So Elizabeth is uh, sitting in the lunchroom at the firm, and in walks Greg, a senior partner uh, on the firm's management committee, and he's wearing a Redskins jersey, which is traditional at the firm on um, game days. Um, Greg grabs Ed, uh, one of Elizabeth's uh, colleagues, 
uh, around the shoulders, and he's hooting and hollering and covering his mouth in a really bad mimic of a Native American from a cartoon. In fact, he beats Ed's back like a drum and um, chides Ed, who's a fan of the Bears, about what the Redskins are going to do to the Bears during that night's game. Uh, so Elizabeth is uncomfortable with Greg's conduct and cheering for the Redskins, but she has been following closely a major case that Greg is working on and has um, recruited Ed to join him with. Um, Elizabeth offers to help with the uh, with the case, and Greg declines her offer and, and lets her know that he really wants her to, to stay focused on the, quote, Indian stuff. So, Michelle, uh, to kick off kind of our walk through through the scenario, if you were presented with this scenario, what would you suggest Elizabeth do in response to what took place, and would you need any any additional information um, in order to to answer more effectively? If I focus on the fact that she was uncomfortable with what Greg did in the lunchroom, let me just start there. One thing I would say unequivocally is I don't think she should just suffer in silence. Even though the the data that Wendy talked about, the women of color are least likely to, are more likely to report. They're also would be proof that they're also hesitant to report because they're not sure of the backlash and the disparate power that's between her and this very senior person with whom she probably wants to work. But when I say don't remain silent, I think I would look at whether she has a mentor or sponsor. Even Elizabeth, who's her managing attorney at the firm, I would even start with Elizabeth because she might be surprised to learn that Elizabeth was as uncomfortable as she is and chose to do nothing at the moment. And so she may have support right there from an eyewitness. But the critical thing to me is to express her concern through the appropriate channels, whether it's an HR person at the firm or someone else in management or even her, her supervising attorney who was present during the escapade. The other thing I guess I would want to know, when she expressed concern about his rebuffing her offer to work on his case, is finding out what the firm's policy is on work assignments. I also would like to know what her understanding was when she joined the firm. Did she make it clear that she was interested in intellectual property, the arts law, rather than what they shuttled her toward? And finally, has she made it known even after she's joined what she wants to do, that what her career aspirations are? And that would be part of a normal performance evaluation process, which I hope she's also getting the type of feedback where she can share her career concerns and, and request. So those are the things that I'd want her to do, as well as things that I'm wondering what the firm has for an infrastructure. No, those are all great points. I mean, it's clear that um, there is some things for um, Elizabeth. There are some things for Elizabeth to do specifically, and I think if you had more information, that would kind of help inform um, perhaps suggested responses. Patty, let me um, go to you next. And while we could all agree that Greg's behavior is abysmal, he is the managing partner of the firm. Um, Elizabeth is a third-year associate, um, perhaps intimidated by, by Greg and his um, position within the firm. What do you think her response to his kind of mockery should be? And, and should she um, respond directly or, or, as Michelle mentioned, maybe get an HR involved? First of all, I, I do think that she should speak to Greg. And I, I understand that some individuals may be hesitant to do this, but I think that she should speak to him and let him know that she finds his remarks and actions offensive. If, um, if he doesn't respond to this, I think that she should speak to HR or someone else in management. I think one of the concerns that Elizabeth may have is possible retaliation. Um, one of the things to look into is whether the firm has a confidential reporting structure through which anti-bias policies can be communicated 
and it's important that women of color feel comfortable in reporting these acts of bias without fear of retaliation or negative repercussion. A major problem that I see here is that she's being treated as if she's invisible, even though she's right there. And this was a key finding in the recent study by the National Native American Bar Association on Native Americans in the profession, um, finding that Native people feel marginalized in the profession. And so there are few Natives in firms, and so I think she has to find some support. Um, and one of the things that is problematic to me is that the partner's actions reflect the mainstream and that the mainstream doesn't recognize our value um, that this is a stereotype. Um, and so that results in this alienation. So I think that this really does need to be addressed by management and that the firm should develop a training program that covers unconscious bias, ethnic and cultural stereotyping, and diversity and inclusion. Because if she is the sole a native at the law firm, she needs support in this voice so that the other people at the firm recognize that this is unprofessional and biased behavior that sh shouldn't be allowed. Great. I think you raised an excellent point. In crafting these scenarios, they really were drawn from, as we said, personal experience, but also the research findings and underscoring your point about the invisibility factor. And in this situation, the fact that Greg felt comfortable enough to say those you know, make those um, comments, um, it, it was as if Elizabeth wasn't even there. And so those on the call may have similar situations where they where they felt invisible. Um, okay, Melvin, next want to ask you to, to weigh in. And I'm sure throughout your career you've had an opportunity to supervise more junior attorneys and um, want to ask you about Ann and whether or not she has an obligation to, um, you know, really look out for the junior associate um, whose career she is kind of in charge of. Yeah, thank you um, for for the question. Uh, and I, I just want to start with a brief uh, disclaimer. Um, what would a government lawyer be on the panel without providing a disclaimer? Uh, and, and that is that uh, the views that I'm going to express are, are those are mine. They don't necessarily reflect the fact of uh, reflect the SBA, uh, the SBA's views. So now that I've done that, let me go to answering your question. Anne has a really serious role to play here, um, and it's and it's a point of integrity for her as well, because obviously she has a responsibility to to help mentor. Uh, Elizabeth, who uh, is looking to take on more responsibility to do more in the firm. And in hearing that comment, one, she should be reaching out to Elizabeth before Elizabeth reaches out to her and certainly showing the concern and demonstrating is, you know, what type of firm is this and that the firm isn't a place that really uh, appreciates those types of comments, but also finding a way so that Anne, excuse me, so that Elizabeth can be able to give voice to her concern without any fear of retaliation. Now, we note Anne here is a junior partner. She has a responsibility, nonetheless, even as, even as a junior partner, she still is designated as someone who's part of the leadership of the firm. So it's really a point of, of integrity for her as to whether is this the type of conduct that the firm believes is allowable and sanctionable uh, even if it is done by someone at, you know, on the management committee. So there may be a, a, a question for Anne, but I do think that she should make sure that Elizabeth has the space to make her concerns known and know that those concerns are appreciated and actually make her feel comfortable in, in raising them. The second thing that I would have uh, Anne do is to work with Elizabeth to try to find ways to leverage not only her expertise in, in Indian law, but also leveraging it into these other fields that she's interested in. So finding opportunities, uh, whether it initially starts out in talking about Indian law, to explore and to do IP work or the other topics that Elizabeth is interested in. But I do see it as Anne's responsibility as sort of her supervisor and mentor to find 
additional opportunities and and also shared by Elizabeth to say, hey, look, I'm, I'm, I'm raising my hand. I'm interested in these other things. Uh, please keep an eye out for them. I'd like to be able to work on these other topics as well. So between the two of them working together, they ought to be able to find a more rewarding uh, diet of work uh, that allows Elizabeth to show the full you know, the full plate of what she can bring in terms of her skills and talent, which is really what all this is about. Uh, the diversity it makes us stronger, and when we recognize the gifts that everyone gets to bring, not just simply those that we think they can bring, uh, we are much stronger for it. Great. Thank you, Melvin. I think you raised some, some really great points, and kind of continuing with something you said about Elizabeth kind of raising her hand, um, Wendy, I'll ask you kind of a similar question. Elizabeth is in her third year. She is you know, very uh, focused on, I'm sure, meeting billable hour requirements and wanting to be seen as a team player and contributing to the firm. But, um, you know, the Native American work um, might not be what she wants to do exclusively. And so do you have suggestions for how she could phrase or um, who she could tell um, um, that uh, she'd like to be able to contribute to the firm in other ways. Uh, thank you, Jasmine. And, and yes, I do have some suggestions. So Elizabeth has a classic dilemma that is shared by many attorneys of color, which is how can we succeed in mainstream institutions while remaining true to our cultural values and our communities of color? Um, as Patty Ferguson Bonney mentioned earlier this year, the National Native American Bar Association unveiled their groundbreaking study on Native American attorneys, the first of its kind. The report is titled The Pursuit of Inclusion, and it reveals that many Native attorneys working in law firms have had precisely the same experience as Elizabeth. So if you are not familiar with that report, I encourage you um, to read it, at least its executive summary, which is available on NABA's website. So on the one hand, Native attorneys have reported that they were motivated to study law in order to serve their communities, specifically to correct injustices against Indian people and also unfair applications of Indian law. But when they expressed a desire to practice in other areas, their employers um, would pressure them to remain in what was perceived as their niche practicing Indian or tribal law. So Elizabeth is definitely on the right track by wanting to broaden her work at the firm while still remaining true to her, um, to her original values and desire to work in, um, in the tribal area. But in order to advance her career, she doesn't want to feel stuck or marginalized. So in addition, yes, yeah, she should definitely talk with Anne as a supervisor, but to, to put a little bit more meat on that bone, she needs to discuss with Anne a specific plan for her to gain experience in other areas, and this will enable Anne to promote Elizabeth's skill to other partners and advocate for her work on other assignments by making introductions, by recommending her for teams, by raising her um, at partner meeting discussions to develop an awareness of Elizabeth and what she can bring to the table. Um, also, for conversations to express interest in work assignments, Elizabeth could develop what we commonly call an elevator speech, and she could use it to combat any of the typical misperceptions that her work in Indian law is so highly specialized that her skills won't translate to other areas. So Elizabeth knows this isn't true, but she needs to educate the partners to that fact. And having a well-honed elevator speech or a library of speeches could help her in that respect. Uh, in trying to strike a balance between remaining true to her roots while feeling uh, fully included in the mainstream legal profession, Elizabeth should remember that it is important for people of color to be successful and to lead in both arenas because we know that our communities of color need successful lawyers to advocate and to serve as powerful role models, but we just can't stick our heads in the sand um, either. Attorneys of color need to be present and accounted for in majority organizations so that we can have impact in affecting change from within. So I guess my advice to Elizabeth is that in order to be um, fully realized as an attorney, she needs to do both, continue her work in Indian and tribal law, but also develop her mainstream skills. That was great. Really insightful, Wendy. I, I think there many on the call could um, appreciate the dilemma that she's in. And, you know, personally, 
being asked to speak at various events or serve on panels or join committees where diversity is at the core, but not allowing that to kind of overtake my day-to-day responsibilities at the firm and being able to strike that balance. I think a plan is a, is a really great way to do that so that you um, plan to work and work your plan, so to speak. Um, Melvin, let me throw back to you a question about Ed, who in the scenario was the colleague sitting at the table with Elizabeth watching this go on. You know, as a, as the male on the, on the call um, in terms of the panelists, you probably have some experiences where perhaps you might not have been the um, kind of the source of some comments, but yet you were there. And so what... Um, Although Ed isn't directly responsible for Elizabeth's career development, what do you believe is a role that he could play in Elizabeth's job satisfaction? No, great question. Thank you for giving me the opportunity on that because uh, Ed also has a role of being able, you know, to pull pull the coattail of Greg to say, "Hey, look, you know, you, you just to make him more mindful," and he can do it in a he can do it from a point of view where, you know. Um, he doesn't have to necessarily have the anxiety or worry about, uh, should not have to necessarily worry about the retaliation. He shouldn't have to worry about retaliation in any, in any circumstance. But it probably lets the individual, it would let Greg know that he sounded a sour note. Uh, and, you know, my, my hope is that maybe Greg would have seen him at the front door and told him to go back and, you know, maybe rethink his outfit. Um, because obviously it's not just simply... The, the the statements, it's also the appearance, right? It's also, you know, not just the words, but the, you know, the the jersey that he was wearing and the and the phrase that's contained on that, because that also uh, presents a, a a visual problem as well. So, I think, you know, what what Ed, what Ed is able to do is be able to speak to. Uh, Greg and, and Greg hopefully be able to see himself as he's hearing Ed uh, and be able to not be so dismissive but actually just listen to what's being said and hopefully take it more to heart. Uh, and again, driving home the point that it's really, it, it's all of our responsibilities to be sensitive uh, about those who, who are raising their hands, but more importantly about those who aren't raising their hands and why they aren't raising their hands. Sure. So before we jump into our lightning round, I'll, I'll end this portion of the discussion um, with Michelle, hoping you might be able to weigh in on a question um, about staffing. Uh, there may be attendees on the call who can identify with Elizabeth and that you are ready for the challenge. You know, here she is, an opportunity to work with a managing partner and get that type of exposure. She's confident. She knows she can handle the work. And um, and she has the time to do it, and has told Greg she has the capacity, but yet doesn't get staffed. And so, was wondering, Michelle, um, how Greg could approach case management and staffing, or whether there are some policies that the firm could implement to um, ensure that attorneys are adequately staffed on matters. I think too often most of us do what we're comfortable doing, which is turning to the person who's most like you the one that can talk about football, for example, although it can be women that talk about football, but there's a high probability it's more going to be a male. And at that point, what you're doing is just reinforcing with the usual suspects. And so one of the things that I think would really take away the tendency to do this is to have a policy that forces the partners and those in management to look at their case assignment more holistically. That is, are you only working with the same people time and time again, or is the work being evenly distributed? So this isn't a popularity contest, but is rather based upon who's in the queue. And that way, I think she wouldn't have to, you know, continuously wave her hand, a hand that no one sees. So the policy of the firm should be more regimented in a way that mitigates this happening. But even if that isn't the case, let's assume that it's whatever the partner in charge decides he or she wants to do. Go back to Wendy's elevator speech, and I think that Ed can play a role in this, similar to what Melvin said, which is he obviously has Greg's ear. He could advocate for for Elizabeth and say, 
you know, she really would love to work on this case, and I would like to have her work with me. Are you okay adding her to the team? It's hard for someone to look at that and not at least pull up short and say, well, maybe I'm missing something. So there's another way to use these people, but both her Anne could do it, Ed could do it, and then Elizabeth could do it by having her elevator speech explaining to, to this gentleman, Greg, why she's capable of doing this right now. So, Jasmine, this is Wendy, and I just wanted to jump in um, and echo Michelle's comment about taking a more holistic view to case assignments. Elizabeth works for a law firm, but Michelle and I work for corporations where sometimes because HR imposes it, we have a more formal structure for succession planning. I can share that in one of my general counsel roles. When I worked on my succession plan, um, I had a grid that required me to identify uh, the best person to immediately succeed me, you know, if I literally got hit by the truck the next day, um, the best long-term successor. And in addition, they asked me to identify diverse candidates in our department who had the potential um, to rise to the position of general counsel. And then we developed a specific um, plan in order to get them there and figured out what the skill gaps were and how we could fill them in if that person were indeed um, interested in advancing in that way. So that's something very specific we can do. Uh, I also wanted to comment that with respect to this scenario, you know, as you read the entire library, you'll note that, that we have identified each of the protagonists as Native American, Latina, African American, Asian American, et cetera. But I wanted to encourage our audience to think about the universality of each of these scenarios. So yes, Scenario 10 is about the experiences of a Native woman. But if you think about other people of color, there are, there are different experiences and ways in which each of us has felt pigeonholed or marginalized within our work environment, even if it wasn't on this very specific um, dilemma that Elizabeth faced um, with the mockery of Native Americans. I know, for instance, I've had African American friends who in law firms believe that their value is perceived as being connections, particularly political connections. They can go out and make the rain, but they're not the ones who are looked upon as having expertise to do the work. And yet, in the, in the API, Asian Pacific American community, it's the exact opposite. Um, APA attorneys say their dilemma is they're perceived as being very weak at business development and indeed at, even at management, but they're, they're smart enough to sit in the back office and do the work. So they're, they're very different. Um, experiences, but they arise from the same issues of implicit bias that may be applied to people of color. So I think we can extract a lot more from each of these scenarios than, than just the specific dilemma of the um, protagonist. That's an excellent point, Wendy, really. And, and as those on the call um, take time to visit the website, I, I think what Wendy said will really resonate you, with you as you move through the, the various scenarios and probably will find yourself navigating along the fact patterns but um, making them more universal than they may um, appear at first blush. Um, any, anything else anyone wants to add with respect to this scenario? It's, it's Michelle Jasmine. You know, one of, one of the things that Wendy's talking about, we had a label for it at a few of the companies where I worked, which is the individual development plan. And it doesn't matter what label you put on it as long as it has the word plan in it. That is, what are you going to do, and this is the comment that you made earlier about have a plan and work your plan, is that you know where you want to go and should never assume someone else knows. And this goes back to her not remaining silent, either about the incident or about what her aspirations are. Great point. And, I, and this is Go ahead. Ferguson Bonnie. I'll just add um, with regards to diversifying the type of work, I um, had a similar experience at a firm that I worked at, and I was working exclusively in Indian law, but Indian law transcends all areas of law. So one of the issues is developing skills, whether it's litigation, transactional business, and um, developing an expertise in that area. So I went to some of the senior partners in litigation, and I asked them if they would train me and if I could work with them on cases and started asking for more work. Uh, and in my annual review, I told them that I really wanted to develop a skill um, and not just be focused in Indian law, but outside of Indian law, so that I could say I'm a litigator, 
or, or something like that. So I think it's really important to have those discussions as a young associate. Great. Yeah, as you can see, these scenarios do have some real life implications. So Patty, thank you for sharing sharing your personal experience. So when we were putting together today's webinar, in addition to giving the attendees access to our great panelists, we really wanted to showcase the scenarios. These are the results of a lot of hard work uh, put in by um, staff and um, commissioners and subcommittees. And so in order to allow the audience to get a feel for what to expect when they download the scenarios, we're going to participate in a bit of a lightning round. And um, in this round, we're going to have each panelist share their experience connected to a particular scenario. And again, these scenarios are available on the, um, on the ABA website. And um, this will give attendees a real sense perhaps this is a situation that you face in your professional career and you'll be able to hear from someone well accomplished in their field how um, they handle the situation or would suggest someone handle a situation. So Patty, we'll start with you and um, just a, a, give us a brief background on the scenario that you chose and why it spoke okay. to you specifically. Okay, um, the scenario that I chose has to deal with salary disparity and billable hours, and the individual's name is Lakeisha, and uh, Lakeisha is the first in her family to attend college, and then she attended a top-ranked law school. She um, started working at a large law firm through the summer associate program, uh, having been hired through the diversity clerkship program, and most of her work assignments come from one individual in a practice group who also attended the same school that she did. And she works with another uh, junior associate whose name is Jeff, and he also, also receives work assignments from the same individual. Um, uh, Jeff joined as a lateral associate, and um, he had already a sophisticated practice and an impressive client base. And they are about at the same rank, and Lakeisha learns that there is a salary disparity when she overhears a discussion between Hiram and Jeff, um, actually a 15% difference in the salary disparity. And she's had good performance evaluations, she hasn't had a lot of feedback, um, and she has had a little bit of difficulty meeting her minimum billable hour requirements. And when she sought additional assignments, um, she wasn't given them, and that was attributed to the poor economy. And, um, and Jeff has obtained more uh, billable hours than her um, over the past few years. And so the reason why Lakeisha resonated with me is because I'm also the first in my family to attend college. I graduated from a top law school. I was also on Law Journal. I clerked for a federal judge. And when I started working as a mid, at, I started working at a mid-sized law firm as a first-year associate. Um, the firm didn't really have a formalized associate program. It was very partner-heavy. And one particular partner would complain that associates made too much. Um, but some of the key differences here that I want to point out is that I actually exceeded my billable hours. I had a high realization rate. Um, and every year I would ask for a raise, and the, um, the management team would complain about the market. They'd say, oh, we can't really give you very much of a raise because we try to find out what were people making at other comparable firms in the area. And so we might get a a small increase uh, similar to a COLA. And of course, coming from the background of the, you know, first to go to school, graduate from college, I kind of had a poor men's mentality. Um, I was already making more money than anyone in my family. I was happy to have a job. I thought that people were, were treating me fairly. Um, I had good reviews. The clients were happy with my work, so of course they're treating me fairly. Well, one summer, um, there was a summer associate who wanted to know how much first-year attorneys expected, should be expected to make. And I was a five-year associate, and there was also a Latina who was a four-year associate. 
and we were actually the only people of color at the firm. So we advised the summer associate that he should ask the first year associate at the firm. And the summer associate reported back to us, and we were shocked to learn that the first year associate was earning more than we were. And the, the first year associate was a white male. He didn't attend a top year law school. He didn't clerk. He wasn't on law journal. And obviously, we were very upset by this news because we had been asking for raises in the past few years. So what did we do? Um, at our firm, the compensation was determined by a five-person management team. So the other associate and I decided to speak to the managing partner to let them know that we were being treated unfairly and uh, requested a raise, which we did receive. And I think the key takeaway from this is that even though the, the firm didn't have a um, published pay scale or a formalized program, that when you advocate for a raise or as a young person in the firm, you should ask for objective metrics to ensure that individuals in your class or level are paid equally for comparable work, regardless of your race, ethnicity, or gender. Teddy, I can only imagine what your face looked like when that summer clerk came back and reported um, what that first year was making. I'm sure you were quite surprised, to say the least. We were, yeah, we were very surprised and we were very angry, especially because we felt like um, we, we worked hard, we exceeded the billable hours, high realization rates, the clients liked us, and the only difference really was that we were females and that we were people of color. So, and Michelle, there maybe be, you want to give a plug for our webinar on negotiating compensation. <laughs> great point. On the, on the 30th is a, a great webinar um, sponsored by the commission. And um, we can have the details available, but I believe it's a lunchtime webinar um, negotiating her way up, um, and it deals directly with this issue on negotiating compensation and benefits. That's a great, great segue, Wendy. Thank you. Um, okay, so uh, next scenario, um, Wendy, kind of same format, I'll ask you to um, give a brief synopsis of the scenario, why you selected it, and um, how you reacted, if this happened to you directly, and whether or not you would react differently um, years later, kind of having the ability to look back and think of things. Thanks, Jasmine. So I chose um, scenario six, which features Nina, who is a Latina woman who works in-house at a bank. Nina is the youngest member of her department, and she's the only person of color. Um, I could relate to this because in most of my career, I've been the only female and the only um, person of color on my various teams in my jobs. Uh, Nina rarely has received explicit feedback on her work, and she's uncertain of how its quality is being perceived. Now, on a recent assignment, the general counsel sent her an email in which he disagreed with her advice to a client in the marketing department. He said that while her legal analysis was correct, her recommendation on how to proceed was too risk-averse. And the general counsel actually copied me and his supervisor and the marketing director on his email. Uh, this scenario raises a number of issues from the perspectives of Nina, her supervisor, and the general counsel. Uh, for starters, let's just say that if Nina feels devastated when she received the email, that would be typical and expected. No one likes to receive negative feedback, and especially in front of her client. Um, but on the other hand, I think that Nina can recover and can learn from this experience. Early in our careers, we have a tendency to react emotionally. So on the one hand, Nina could be overly defensive and think her thought balloons could be, the general counsel doesn't know what he's talking about. How dare he do this to me? Uh, and on the other hand, Nina could be crushed. And those thought balloons would say, this is the wrong job for me. I obviously can't succeed here, so I better start looking for a new job. Maybe it was a mistake going to law school in the first place. These are extreme reactions she might have. Um, and I'm sure that each of us has had these visceral reactions. But I know that Nina can persevere. 
uh, to apply the teachings of the Commission on Women's Grit Project, she needs to develop grittiness and to have a growth mindset about advancing in her career. Uh, so during my in-house career with three different public companies, one of the biggest challenges was learning the difference between legal analysis and applying it in the business setting. Early in our careers, we have a ten tendency to think that senior people must be correct when they disagree with us. Little did we know, right? Um, we need to remember that we're the ones who did the research. We may very well have more in-depth and detailed knowledge of the legal issues. But on the other hand, our clients and supervisors probably have a broader understanding of the business facts underlying the legal issue, and therein lies the rub. So in this hypothetical, the general counsel said that Nina's legal analysis was correct, and she should take that as a positive and not just have selective hearing and focus on the negative part. Um, his criticism raised a question about judgment and risk appetite. Judgment is very difficult to learn, but risk appetite varies from organization to organization. So Nina can indeed learn more about the business climate at the bank so that she can calibrate her advice appropriately. You know, in-house attorneys are often worried about being perceived as deal killers. I can't tell you how many times I've heard from clients, don't tell me what I can't do, tell me how I can do it. Um, it's much easier to do this when we're consulted earlier on in the process before business decisions have actually been made. Uh, so a key area of development in my in-house career that would have impacted me in the NEMA scenario is learning as much as possible about my company's underlying business, its financial performance and outlook, strategic objectives, business model, key performance indicators, and the drivers of success. We can't give legal advice in a vacuum, and clients who know that you know their business will bring you to the table earlier in the process and will better respect your advice. Um, I want to pivot to another issue presented in the scenario, which is the possibility of implicit bias impacting the general counsel's view of Nina's business acumen. Um, in the in-house arena, Nina has three strikes against her. She's young, she's a woman, and she's a person of color. My first in-house position was with a manufacturing company in a highly conservative sector. Our CEO used to describe our industry as male and pale, and then they hired me. Um, you know, I'm not certain that clients knew what to make of me, and in the, the beginning, it was an uphill battle to win their trust and confidence and prove that I added value to the team. The more senior I became, the easier it got, um, in part because I actually did know more from my experience, particularly about our business, uh, but also because I had the benefit of a more senior title that carried a presumption of competence. And most importantly, with age comes a heightened sense of security and self-confidence. Finally, I wanted to comment um, that having worn that hat, I had a very strong reaction to the general counsel's conduct in this scenario. He might have had efficiency in the bigger picture in mind when he copied Nina's supervisor and the client on his reply email, but it potentially undermines Nina with her client and indirectly the entire legal department. So for those of us who supervise others, I, I would underscore the importance of always having our people's backs vis-a-vis -vis our clients and trying to provide constructive criticism um, in a private forum. Yeah, that CC function, it, it really can wreak havoc <laughs> when, when used um, too loosely or inappropriately or sometimes even in a passive-aggressive way. So I'm, I'm sure each of us can describe a situation um, similar to that. Well, thanks, Wendy. Um, gosh, if someone described an industry as male and pale, that's tough. <laughs> um, Melvin, moving on, if you could do the same, follow our um, previous panelists in describing your scenario. Sure. Um, I chose scenario four, uh, which involves Rachel, who's a Native American woman, attended a top tier law school partner at a large firm. Uh, after having her second child, she went part-time, uh, but still stays very active, writes articles, speaks on panels, mentors, associates. Sounds like her half-time is probably full-time for most of us. Um, one, of her, one of her past clients approached Rachel and said she was, they were thinking about adding Rachel's firm to their list, but concerned about how diverse they were. 
and whether or not they uh, really had a solid commitment to diversity and inclusion. Uh, and shortly after that conversation, uh, Rachel had been approached by the managing partner of her firm, uh, asking her to spearhead the firm's diversity and inclusion efforts. And while Rachel felt this is an important, certainly an important subject, important item, it's the right focus, uh, she was personally concerned with, you know, her being tasked with this, how does that get, uh, how does that impact her ability to practice, you know, her, her profession, how does it impact on work-life balance, uh, how will this be graded, how will the hours put towards diversity and inclusion count when it's time to start uh, discussing compensation. And already being at part-time and now having another duty put on to her uh, just raise not only structural questions but also personal questions for her. Uh, this spoke to me because of, you know, um, a bit of the pigeonholing in a different way than we discussed in the earlier scenario. Uh, it is ironic that as a firm, is this, the firm in this example is thinking about uh, having a diversity and inclusion committee, they turn to the one partner uh, who is diverse and then that partner who's on part-time and adding, adding this to their duties. So I, I looked at this scenario as a wonderful opportunity for, for Rachel to kind of pivot the question. Uh, and so as she's approached by the managing partner, I think that's an invitation to have a discussion and there ought to be some welcoming to it. So I would think that Rachel would at the first instance say, wow, it, this is great. I'm, I'm happy to see the firm is, sees the importance of diversity and inclusion and that we're going to put forward this committee. Equally important is that the tone at the top be set. Uh, and, you know, diversity has to be seen as something that is a value uh, at the top of the firm all the way down, not just something that is seen as a check-the-box function or as any type of must-do. Uh, it should be viewed as not only we should do, we ought to do, and we will do, and we're excited to do. It should be viewed as that. And I would hope that Rachel would have that conversation with the managing partner about how important it is to set the tone at the top. And then let's talk about expectations. Uh, what does spearheading really mean? How will, how, will the law, how will the law firm count this work on the diversity committee? Will they count it the same way as, as they're measuring billable hours? Will billable hours put on doing uh, diversity and inclusion work count towards compensation? Uh, will it be measured and rewarded the same way that firms uh, do often on pro bono work? Uh, and more importantly, how will the leadership of the firm communicate this in a way that it is seen and known and communicated as a value and an important value of the firm so that it is uh, work that all of the firm is looking at doing and not just any particular segment uh, of the firm? And hopefully the firm will be able to view that this investment in, in doing this, uh, setting up this committee and being serious and putting out metrics and goals and plans and what's going to be measured and holding people accountable, uh, that this will send the signal that the firm is very interested and serious about their commitment to diversity and not just simply looking for some type of uh, uh, show horse or uh, some type of uh, check the box function. Now, for Rachel personally, I think it's equally important for her to have these, these direct conversations about what would be expected of her as, you know, as a partner. And this is the work that she's going to be doing on this, how is that going to come impact her when it's time to uh, divvy up the profits of the firm? Uh, there should in no way be any uh, negative inference or detriment or penalty given to her for her work in stepping up and doing the diversity and inclusion work as, as, rest, as well as the rest of the firm. But it's going to be important to make sure that those conversations are had at the outset and that expectations are set and agreed upon and that everyone's held accountable on that going forward. Um, but I do think it's a step in the right direction and, and hopefully having had those conversations uh, Rachel will be able to move forward in the firm, will have a very successful diversity effort, one which she can then go back to this former client of hers and bring them back into the firm uh, as new business.
and helping giving very tangible evidence to the business case for diversity and how making this type of investment really does improve the bottom line and leads to greater profitability. That, that's excellent, Mel. I mean, a really robust answer. I, I really hope people are taking notes um, because I think embedded in his answer is, is practically a script that uh, that you can use to get started in, in addressing this situation. Melvin, just out of curiosity, why did this particular scenario speak to you? Have you dealt with something similar directly or indirectly? Yeah, what what spoke to me is, uh, you know, it is the, the situation that I think all of us have felt uh, Oh well, I'm going to go see a diverse. I'm pitching for uh, I'm pitching for business uh, that uh, the 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 company has said diversity is important to them. So let me bring my lawyer of color. Uh, we want to say that diversity is important to us, so we're going to put uh, you know a lawyer of color in a in a position to talk about diversity. And while some might think it expedient, it's incredibly short sighted and myopic. And and I think you know I I, I found it. I found it a little offensive that they were coming to the, the one partner who's on part-time, who's already doing a great deal of other work, mentoring, doing everything, and then putting this on top of that individual without really expressing that this is something that belongs to the entire firm. Uh, and we have to get to a point where, you know, diversity is appreciated as everyone's business and that whether we're, uh, you know, whether we're a woman of color or not, uh, you know, how successful they are in our firms or our in-house departments means that we're all successful, uh, and we have to take that vested interest in it. So uh, that's why this particular example spoke to me and why I thought it, would, it, it presented an interesting opportunity because I think as a younger lawyer I might have said, you know, why me? You know, uh, But instead I, I thought that Rachel could take this opportunity to pivot it a bit and say, hey, great, congratulations, welcome to the conversation. I don't want to turn you off from the conversation, but welcome to it. Now let's talk about how we, as a collective effort, do this. Uh, and the last point I'd make is just from my in-house career, you know, the diversity efforts that I have seen in my in-house career that were successful were those that were led by the top of the firm and directly tied to the bottom line of the firm. So if someone's compensation was going to be impacted about how they engaged in diversity efforts, you saw very robust and active engagement. Uh, if it was just simply deemed as a, well, this is nice, uh, it would be great if you could do this, uh, you didn't see as much of a robust effort. And it really showed the importance of tone at the top. And so it, it can't be, certainly in, a, in the in-house setting, diversity should not be and can't be seen as, oh, it's just an HR function or, oh, it's just the, something the legal or compliance department says we have to do. No, it's got to come from the top level of the firm saying, this is one of our values, just as much as increasing shareholder value or growing our business or expanding our profits per partner, this is one of our core bedrock values. And when it's communicated in that way as a tone for the top, you see a different attitude and acceptance uh, from you know, from everyone in in that particular enterprise about how they embrace diversity. Well, thank you, a amen and amen, Melvin. Thank you so much for that uh, great answer, Michelle. Want to ask you to share with us a scenario that resonated with you and why, and then kind of walk us through how you um, handled that scenario or, or would have handled it. So I chose the supplier diversity program, which is scenario number eight. And having been in, in various Fortune 500 companies, all, all of which had supplier diversity programs, many of the facts in this particular scenario resonated with me. Not all of them, but, but the majority of them. The other reason it also resonated with me is it relates to another initiative of the commission, which is power of the purse. And that's having GCs believe that what they do when they select outside counsel who have diverse teams, how they can use their economic power to ensure that this happens and not just give it lip service. So scenario number eight, Priya is the general counsel of a Fortune 500 company. She's South Asian. She's the only woman of color in the executive suite. 
And despite the fact that the company has a supplier diversity initiative, she's gotten pushback from her colleagues when she return, retains some attorneys of color and has even been accused of hiring her friends when she's engaged Indian Americans, you know, and that would be all three of them, because there are not that many. I'd like to know where she found them. That's one of the struggles that you have on occasion is people will say, oh, what, you know, there are no Native American or Indian lawyers to hire. So she has found some, and yet they are accusing her of only those people that she has a relationship with. So even within the C-suite, there's no walk in the park. Then you move to the VP of purchasing, who's basically said to her, I'm not interested in your large law firm initiative to have diverse teams because I get credit when you hire minority-owned and women-owned businesses. And Melvin, as head of the SBA's general counsel's office, I guess you can relate to this. So he doesn't want to give her any credit for working with larger law firms where there are diverse teams. Within her own ranks, she's also heard rumblings that they always hire the best lawyers, and when they do that, it's just who the team is. And instead, what's implicit in this, and you can call it bias or some other pejorative name, I suppose, is that when you hire people of color, they're less qualified. So these are the struggles that she is going through. And again, I've related to some of these, particularly with the purchasing department, saying, I get no credit when you hire large law firms. What I have found from my experience is that you have to educate your colleagues. And by that, you'd have to say all of the work of the company isn't going to be done by MBEs or WBEs, that there is a need to have a diverse range of law firms. Diversity cuts across everywhere. And that means working with some of the larger law firms. And to do that, I need to insist that those teams are diverse. And to do this, I think she has to work with her own lawyers most general counsels, and Wendy can identify with this, as I'm sure Melvin can, they're frequently not the ones on the front line hiring of these various law firms. It's the folks on their teams. So you want those people to know they've got the power to do it, that you are backing them, and that it's a collective approach. It is not the general counsel's will. It is the will of the company to have diversity in its ranks and outside that it would mirror that. And this goes back to Melvin's comment it is not lip service. It is not checking the box. But I think that means you need to bring your team along with you and not simply have an edict. So for all of this, I think that what Freya has to do is educate, educate, educate. You've got to educate the C-suite. And to do this, there was a very simple question someone raised. If the male had been white and the general counsel had been white, would you have accused the general counsel of hiring his friend? That probably dramatizes this point that it's really the perception of someone that is way off base because they don't understand that quality is everywhere and that white males do not have a monopoly on it. So I think there's some real frank discussions that have to take place that might not be uncomfortable with Priya, but she's got the power of her position and the power of her voice to educate her colleagues. And then if she forms a team among her own lawyers, I think she can bring them along as well because she's going to educate them about seeing a broader spectrum of talent. And the purchasing guy, you got to have coffee, take him out to drink, whatever works, and educate him about the legal profession, which he probably doesn't have a great deal of interest in, but you can help him get there. And you might want to enlist some allies among your colleagues, because there have got to be some, you would hope, that would also echo her same sentiments. So that would be my response. Excellent. Thank you. I, and I agree the educational component is critical. In a slightly different vein, for those who saw Viola Davis's acceptance speech, she talked about the difference between women of color actresses and, and white women and saying the only difference is opportunity. And so your point about you know, some groups thinking that they have a monopoly on talent and competence and how to debunk that I think is, is critical. Um, before we conclude the lightning round, were there any final thoughts from the panelists about um, a scenario that was mentioned that you wanted to weigh in on? Well, for the attendees, I hope you can – oh, go ahead. 
The one thing I would say, and, and I do believe all, I, I agree with all my colleagues about the splendid and excellent advice that we've gotten this afternoon, but there are times when if you're in the wrong environment, you've got to be willing to walk. Absolutely. Absolutely. And um, and that means being prepared to, to do that and, and the things that go into being prepared. So um, I think that attendees will recognize the value of the toolkits um, and that they are really providing real life situations. And what we just had with our, each of our panelists is, is akin to almost office hours where you could literally ask them how they would react to a certain situation um, and getting their diverse um, responses to a variety of scenarios that the research has shown us are happening to women of color attorneys uh, throughout the country. So we definitely encourage um, you to visit the website, participate in uh, discussion in your workplace using the toolkits as the kind of main entree for those discussions. Um, they are applicable, they are relatable, and the, um, they are created by women of color attorneys. So at this point, having concluded kind of our formal program, um, I encourage everyone listening to um, think about and digest what was shared and feel free to use the platform to post questions to um, our esteemed panel. Um, I have received one question already for Wendy. And Wendy, uh, could you share in a little bit more detail the points that one would need to include in an elevator um, speech? Yes, thanks, Jasmine. First of all, for the people on the line, I hope that the term elevator speech is well understood. Um, you know, it, it arose from the situation in which you, you enter the first floor elevator and you find that you are alone in the elevator with the CEO, the general counsel, the senior partner. And um, the, the challenge is how will you use that time productively as you ride to the top floor and not squander it by babbling about the weather, you know, or your car breakdown, but being able to say something that is meaningful and succinct um, to that particular person. So when I mentioned having a, a library of elevator speeches, I don't think there's a single one that we need. We need a whole library of them. And in the context of Elizabeth wanting to seek um, assignments in, in areas that would broaden her experience beyond specific um, assignments in Indian and tribal law, the concept that I would have in mind is for her to learn to talk about her particular skills in a way that shows broad application to other um, areas of law. So if somebody were to say to her at lunch, so what are you working on? Um, it would be very tempting to do a really deep dive into the specific issues of Indian law that are implicated in her current case. And the other person might be interested, might not be interested, but that would reinforce the viewpoint that she is the firm's specialist in this area, but that's the only thing she can work on. So she needs to extrapolate, and rather than focusing on the substantive content of Indian law, she needs to focus on the skills that she's been using. Um, and it depends on your, your situation. The skills could be research, drafting, um, oral advocacy. Um, I took a deposition last week. I attended a hearing and argued on behalf of a motion um, in the transactional area. You know, I am negotiating. Um, I am working on um, getting government clearance. So think about describing what you're doing in a way that would have broader application to other areas of the law and not get lost in the details of the subject matter um, that you're working on. And, Wendy, the way I think of that is coming up, again, I don't know how tall the building is, but assuming that this elevator ride doesn't go on for more than maybe two, three minutes max, it might be even closer to, you know, to 90 seconds, is what is it the transfers is what I think you're saying. All of the skills you've named transfer to any subject matter that she might be interested in. Exactly, exactly. But at, at its it's Elizabeth's burden and responsibility to draw that connection and not expect Greg or the other senior partners to instantly see it on their own. Absolutely. Yep, great. And it's Melvin, Again, if, I could, if, I, if I could add to that, that everything you heard is, is absolutely spot on, brilliant. I would simply 
uh, ask that folks also think about, you know, sometimes the elevator speech happens outside of an elevator. Sometimes you, you happen to be uh, somewhere else and you've cornered that individual. And so you really should have that in, in the back of your mind. And also being prepared and understanding who your client or who your CEO or who your general counsel is. Uh, and I will tell you, nothing is, as a general counsel, nothing is more refreshing than if someone's aware of a particular problem that I'm noodling with, uh, comes to me and says, hey, you know, I've been thinking about that issue you're struggling with, and here I've got some thoughts on it. Um, anyone that is showing an interest trying to make, we all try to make our bosses' jobs easier. So to the degree that not only showcasing your skill set, but also showing that you've thought about uh, a problem of one of your you know, uh, your partner or your general counsel or your supervisor uh, is certainly a way that distinguishes you from a lot of the other individuals who are, are looking for, looking for uh, other opportunities. And could I just echo this as well? Let's assume that some of your skills, you know, you can outline them. They're not that long of a list. But at the end of the day, you also evidence the fact that you're looking for a new challenge. Mm-hmm that you want to grow, and this goes back to the grit, this growth mindset, that you're looking to do something that you haven't necessarily nailed. And the other thing you want to be mindful of, besides not always looking for an elevator, is know who has the ear of the person you want to get to. That's critical, understanding Michelle, your, your own organization. I, I would echo that, that Michelle's comment um, underscores the importance of um, having champions and advocates. So we've kind of moved past the point of talking about mentors, although I have to say that at Bar Association receptions, I still have law students and junior attorneys walk up to me at some point and very bashfully say, would you be my mentor? (laughs) Um, Not quite understanding how to build those relationships. Um, But within the workplace, we need to have sponsors and advocates. And everybody on the line who is beyond, you know, probably their third to fifth year in practice can not only um, be developing sponsors and advocates for themselves, but can serve in that role for junior people in the organization. You're kind of the sandwich generation where you can be on both the receiving and giving end. It's very powerful to have an advocate and to serve as an advocate on behalf of people in the organization, to point out their skills, to say as we're putting the team together, hey, if we thought about X or Y, um, who could make a real contribution to that team? So advocacy is, uh, is very important and sponsorship. Thank you, Wendy. Again, I'll encourage the attendees, feel free to type in your questions and we'll have the panelists address them as time permits. Patty, if you could, I know you mentioned at various points you've been the only or or one of very few. Any suggestions on how our attendees could even broach the topic of presenting the toolkit? So we've made it known that these great resources are available, they're free, all they need to do is download them, but any suggestions on how they might start the conversation uh, that would lead to getting a group together within their workplace to participate in the scenarios that we've drafted? Yeah, I think thankfully um, there's been more discussion recently about implicit bias and the need for diversity and inclusion um, across the board, and I think that's a very positive thing. And um, I think within your workplace, even if you're the only one, the only person of color, the only Native, the only Hispanic, um, or or, um, LGBT, you know, I think it's important to have those discussions and bring it to management or to HR to um, ask for a program on diversity and inclusion or implicit bias as a CLE. And you can work with your local bar associations to have someone from the bar association come into your workplace, the firm, or um, your uh, general counsel's office to offer a free CLE um, for the attorneys. But I do think it's helpful if it's mandatory and that the firm provides food. That's, you know, that's something that happens within firms. So it's within the normal course. Um, and I think that's a good way to work with that. And I, and I do encourage people, um, you know, people of diverse backgrounds to work with their local bars for that support 
and, and also within their state bars for that support because there is support out there and there are resources out there and the toolkit can be used in that way so that people from the outside can use the toolkit and bring the scenarios in um, if you're concerned about it coming from you and you presenting. Um, I think it's appropriate to have other people from the outside come to the inside and present. And the other thing that I did want to add is um, as we think about elevator speeches and advocates and champions, is that a lot of times people of color are not very boastful. We don't um, talk about our accomplishments because we're raised to not do so. Um, but I think if we're talking about our elevator speeches and people are asking us what we're working on or we want to bring out our skills, that we need to develop that in a way so that people understand what we're doing and the value that we provide. And I think that you can use champions and advocates to do that for you, um, but you need to make sure that people know what you're doing um, and that you're visible. And Jasmine, to, to just echo what Patty said, one thing that I think, and it's a little different from the elevator speech, but it's a close second, which is know what your brand is. Like when people describe you, what are the three things? And, and you can call it boastful or you can just call it advertising, whatever works for you. But it's literally being able to say, you know, I'm really good at advocacy, I write well, and I'm a hard worker, and I'm looking for my next, my next assignment. Excellent, right. In fact, there's a great book about Steve Jobs. It talks about kind of how he was able to succinctly market Apple products and really um, bite-size phrases so that the journalist reporting on tech could describe the product and, and ended up providing Apple with some free marketing. And so I would just encourage attendees to have some short, succinct phrases that you can relay to champions and others who then can parrot those back um, when they're out and about and chatting about you when you're not in the room. Well, I think the panel has done a great job of giving you a sense of what there is to offer in these phenomenal scenarios. Um, they've also provided you with some real strategies based on real-life situations on how you can move forward along your uh, professional um, path. We have provided you with links to all of the information shared today, um, including the deck in its entirety. But if you're interested in learning more about the, the research initiative, as well as getting access to the scenarios, not all of which were discussed during our call today, then please use these resources um, as they've been provided to you and share with your respective networks. Uh, not only women of color, but um, men of color and majority women and men as well should be made aware of the great resource that the Commission on Women in the Profession has provided. So seeing no other questions, we thank you for your time today and look forward to sharing um, more success stories from the Commission in the future. Thank you.